So here's some stats that I thought at least were interesting. From the Journal of Wildlife Diseases, if you line up a bunch of rabid animals, a fox, a cat, a horse, or whatever, the fox is the most likely animal to bite you in an encounter. And a gray fox more so than a red fox. Why, I don't know, and who sat there and figured this out, it's beyond me, but 70% of cattle, 80% of sheep go through the furious rabies stage. Less than 10% of, of rabid ferrets show aggressive aggression, so most of them are very docile and you're not even gonna know or suspect rabies. 55% of rabid cats and 31% of rabid dogs bite people. I thought it'd be a lot higher than that, but I thought that was interesting. Some more stats. Back in 1947, about 7,000 dogs in this country were diagnosed with rabies. Fortunately, today, only 70. So obviously, with vaccinating our dogs, it's come a long way in preventing rabies. And in fact, the dog rabies virus variant doesn't even occur anymore in the United States. All the, our dogs are, have either uh, raccoon or skunk or bat variant rabies. Human deaths in the 30s, 250 people a year in the United States were dying of rabies. Now it averages about two per year. So that's a big improvement too, fortunately. So we've seen a little bit about rabies through the years, what it does to you, how it works, how uh, it's kind of tapered off in the years, fortunately, since the early 1900s. So, what about you now? What about working with animals in the shelter or whatever organization you're with? Are you at risk? Are you potentially gonna come in contact with rabid animals here in New York State? Here's some stats from 2011. New York State was number five in the country in rabies, total rabies in 2011. That means domestic animals and wild animals combined. Number five in the country with 381 cases. And we were number three in the country in domestic animal rabies. Dogs, cats, horses, cows, all those things. Number three in the country. And the graph shows the breakdown of, of all the cases um, from New York State in 2011. We see there's one dog on there, seven cows, there were 38 cats, and obviously raccoons uh, took the lead with 162. But looking at the 38 cats, 25 of those cats that had rabies were feral. So keep that in mind, those of you who do trap, neuter, and release. Nine were owned and four were stray cats. Here's a, a county map of New York State. For those of you who are not geolog uh, geographically challenged, uh, you can find your county and see how many cases of rabies were confirmed from your county. The first one where? 11 slash. Oh, the first number is the positives out of how many, um, how many samples that were sent into the lab for diagnosis. As an aside, I find it interesting that Erie County uh, sent in 863 Jeez. samples, thanks to Dr. Chevalier over here, um, where Monroe County, where I live and practice, in where Rochester is, we only sent in 119. Now, what's interesting to me is I think every county health department takes a different view of rabies. In our county, we've been told unless the animal is showing signs we think it has rabies and it bit somebody, they don't want the body. So if a, an animal comes into our shelter, it's foaming at the mouth, it has a neon sign over its head flashing rabies, 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 if it didn't bite anyone, our health department doesn't want us to submit it. Erie County apparently is different where if you just walk it along the street and someone says, look at that baby, oh, rabies, okay, let's send it in. <laughs> so it's interesting to know what different health departments do throughout the state. And obviously with budget cuts and, and economic problems, they probably don't want to take as many samples and have to process them either. Right. I mean, uh, probably the more you sent in, the more, more positives you'll have also. Um, so in 2011, Westchester was the uh, grand prize winner with 61 cases. Erie County was second with 24, one cap. Tompkins County, where we are today, had eight, no domestic animals. Monroe County, where I live, had five, one cat, which we'll talk about a little later. Tioga County is the one with the one dog. 
So let's talk a little bit about rabies in Monroe County, where, where Lollipop Farm is, where I work and, and live is. Live is. Um, in 2000, there was a visiting professor from Africa who came to SUNY Brockport. Apparently, he was bit by a puppy before he left his country, came here six months later, dies of rabies. In 2003, there was a rabid fox jumped into someone's yard and attacked a five-year-old girl. 2008, in the town of Parma, some homeowners came out to their backyard, saw their two dogs wrestling with a raccoon. They were able to kill the raccoon and preserve it, its head so they could send the brain out for analysis. Turned out the raccoon had rabies. Of course, the people's dogs were not vaccinated. <laughs> so they decided to quarantine the dogs for six months. And unfortunately, two months into the quarantine, one of the dogs started showing signs of rabies, and they both had to be euthanized. Also in 2008, a church for, uh, in the town of Churchville, a woman pulled a bat out of a swimming pool that had rabies. In 2013, a woman was walking her cat one day. <laughs> this woman works at Lollipop, by the way, but she's in administration, so that explains a lot. And she and her cat, unfortunately, were attacked by a raccoon that ran away, and she had to go through the post-exposure treatment now. So this is Daisy. This, is my, this was my dog. She was a slightly overweight, 185-pound <laughs> English Mastiff that we got from rescue way back when. And she was about 11 years old or so in 2007. And we live in your typical suburban housing subdivision. Our backyard backs up to other people's backyards. No woods over there or anything. And one morning, I let her out to go do her thing in the backyard. And she Bottles outside, and she's out there. And all of a sudden, I hear her barking, and she had a loud, deep bark, barking and crying, and things, sounds that I never really heard her make. So I go look, I open up the patio door, and I see she's wrestling around with something on the ground way in the backyard. And so I don't know what's going on, so I scream, Daisy, Daisy. So she gets up, she runs as fast as she could. I haven't seen her run that fast in years. She was <laughs> arthritic, she had other health problems going on by that point and I see something's following her. So she barely makes it in the house and I try to slam the door closed and halfway in the house is a fox. So the door is holding the front half of the fox in my house and the back half out of the house. And I look at Daisy and she's all bitten up around her rear end and her hocks and her legs and there's blood coming from her and I look at the fox and he's spitting bloody saliva on the floor and on the wall. And then my wife comes downstairs and she's like hysterical and, and um, I don't own a gun. So I have my wife hold the door and I go get a broom and I'm try, gonna try and push the fox out with the broom. And the fox grabs the broom and ah, and shaking it. <laughs> and then finally we are able to push the fox back outside and slam the door. So you tell, and we never caught the fox, but you tell me. So this fox is running around the backyards broad daylight, attacks a 185-pound dog, and then tries to follow it inside a house. If that fox doesn't have rabies, I don't know who does. Moving along, this was Emma. This is the, the kitten um, one that Monroe County had the one cat rabies case. This kitten came into our shelter, was admitted as a stray in July of 2011, six weeks old, one and a half pounds. Its right rear leg was mangled, there were bite wounds on it, and its other foot had some bite wounds on it. And it looked like the bite wounds were about, you know, four or five days old. It wasn't, didn't just happen that day. Um, so we stabilized her, gave her antibiotics, fluids, et cetera, et cetera. Decided to amputate the leg. She recovered from that. A few days later, we noticed that her toe on one of her other feet was really nasty looking, and we amputated that. She recovered from that without a problem. One of our technicians, one of our new technicians, actually, decided to take her into foster care. It's great, so let her recover. Then she decided, well, I'll just adopt her and keep her, and, and okay, that's great. So two months go by. The technician was off that day. All of a sudden, she calls calls us in the clinic, and I'm talking to her on the phone, and she says, I don't know what's going on with Emma. Yesterday, she was very lethargic. She wouldn't eat. 
She's just laying there. She actually threw up some roundworms and some fluid. So I'm like rolling my eyes. How does she have roundworms? You know, we wormed her a million times. What's going on? And et cetera. And then she continues with the story. And this morning, so I separated her from the other cats and the dog. And I put her in her own room overnight. And this morning, she's ravenous. She won't stop eating. She's vocalizing. She's screaming. And then this afternoon, the vocalizing is getting louder, and she's carrying on, and she's scratching at the door to get out and throwing herself against the door, and she's acting real weird. And then I went in there to calm her down. I'm sitting with her, and she bit me on the foot, on the hand, on the thigh. So I, har I hearkened back to when this kitten came in. And I'm pretty impressed, because I can't usually remember what I had for breakfast in the morning. <laughs> But I remembered what she looked like when she came in. So I said, Kelsey, I think we have a problem here. You need to bring her in. I think she might have rabies. So she hung up the phone. She was coming in with that. I said, oh, I got to go. Sorry. And then I left <laughs> and, <laughs> and left the other vet there to deal with this. But no, seriously, I did have an appointment or something. Um, so I didn't see. I didn't see the kitten when she came in, but the other vet told me she never saw anything like this in her life. She, the, cat, the kitten was acting like she was possessed. Never saw anything like it. They euthanized the kitten, sent the head out, and sure enough, she's positive for rabies. So let's think about this for a second. First off, it's a little strange. I mean, how does a one and a half pound, six week old kitten survive an attack? from a rabid animal. That's, my, that's mind boggling to me. Secondly, what would have happened if our technician did not adopt this kitten? We were fortunate, quote unquote, that she did, that it was in her house. Somebody who has some, some knowledge about rabies and what goes on with it. A cute little kitten like this, three legs, she would have been adopted in a heartbeat from the shelter. What would have happened if this kitten was in someone's house? People, let's say, have kids, got plenty of kids playing with the kittens day in, day out. How many people would have had to have gone for post-exposure treatment? A lot, probably. What kind of PR message does that send any also? Oh, come to Lollipop Farm and adopt a kitten. It comes spayed or neutered. It comes vaccinated, dewormed, leukemia tested. Oh, and as an extra benefit, it can have rabies too. <laughs> How many people are going to come in and adopt an animal after that would hit the press? So we were very fortunate in that sense that it was in the technician's home and not adopted out. What happens if she was the kitten was at Lollipop waiting to be adopted? What happens if she was in a, a a cattery with other kittens. All those kittens would have been euthanized. What happens if she was in a cage by herself? You have staff interacting with her, volunteers interacting with her, the public coming in and maybe looking to see if they wanted to adopt her and interacting with her. What about the public health nightmare that that would bring? Trying to find all the people that potentially interacted with her as she developed signs of rabies. Another bad thing about rabies is in dogs, cats, and ferrets, they could be shedding the virus a few days even before they show symptoms. So you're extra screwed with that. So what should we do? What kind of policy should we adopt in these kind of cases? I don't have the answer. In Massachusetts, for example, they have a regulation that if an animal comes into the shelter with um, a bite wounds of unknown origin, the animal either has to be quarantined for six months or euthanized. Who has the ability to quarantine an animal for six months in their shelter? Most of us don't. Who wants to euthanize animals if they come in with bite wounds? Most of us don't, certainly. People bring in animals all the time. They have bite wounds. The admission people will ask them, oh, well, how this dog get this bite wound over here? So, you know, the, the the admitters might say, oh, he was fine with a dog next door, or the cat was fine with another cat in the house, whatever. But you know, we all know admitters um, sometimes don't remember the facts, um, not forthcoming with the facts, or how can I put this gently? They lie and lie and lie when they bring in their animals. So that's one problem with that scenario of, of bites of, of origin. 
How many animals come in that have bite wounds that have healed? That we don't even know they have a bite wound. Or it's just a little scratch now. Well, I don't know where that was from. I mean, what are you going to do? You know, you run into this problem all the time. And rabies could take, in this little kitten's case, even two months from infection to symptoms. So what do you do with these animals? I don't have the answer. We, we discussed this at the shelter for a while, and we, no one could come up with a, a plan to avoid this scenario again and for getting worse. We're certainly not going to start euthanizing animals because they come in with a bite wound, but it can turn into a big problem like this almost did. What do you do in your shelters? Do you have uh, any kind of protocol as far as um, what happens when an animal comes in with a bite wound? Are you quarantining it for six months to make sure it doesn't come down with signs of rabies? Are you euthanizing it? Are you turning it away? I don't know. 